when somebody's a resident and they see a lot of patients and make a lot of quick decisions, wow, she's such a strong resident. It's like strong. Yeah, she's amazing. That's true. She's performing really well. But is she strong on the inside? Is she like bottling up all of the trauma from the patient, the horrible bad news she had to give to the young father who just got diagnosed with metastatic cancer? Or is she going home and crying over it because it, the grief is so heavy? We don't look at that. The language of medicine is about show up, toughen up, work your night shift, do the right thing, don't make any mistakes, be strong. And that's really hard to be sustainable for an individual. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why stress, mental health issues, suicide, attrition, burnout, like these are uh, all predictable consequences. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Mike Stone. Now, Dr. Stone has been in medical practice for almost 20 years and currently serves as the chief education officer at Wild Health. Later in the episode, you'll hear me spell it wrong, so let's spell it here correctly just for the record. It's Wild Health, W-I-L-D-H-E-A-L-T-H. Dr. Stone has held academic appointments at Harvard Medical School and at UCSF and has received multiple national awards for education, innovation, and leadership in medicine. He spent the bulk of his career focusing on educating students, trainees, and colleagues. Now, along the way, he's also had a huge influence on me personally when I was his resident at what is now Mass General Brigham Organization, but then was Brigham and Women's Hospital. Mike is obsessed with optimal health and peak performance, and he has a deep interest in the effects of lifestyle interventions to improve longevity and cognitive function. He is currently focused on knowledge translation for healthcare practitioners, striving to empower practitioners with practical techniques to competently construct strategies and tactics for their patients' health optimization. In this episode, we're going to jump into the deep waters of the preparation and recovery parts of our Prepare, Perform, Recover, Evolve cycle. We're going to talk about sleep, nutrition, caffeine, night shift work, and a ton more. Listen, I'll be honest, this episode really changed how I think about setting myself up personally to succeed at what I do, especially our conversation about the Alara principle and how it applies to work on the front line. Before we get started, a reminder, if you're enjoying what we do here at the Emergency Mind Project and you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's called Knowledge Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com slash signup. Also, if you want to help support our work here at the Emergency Mind Project more directly, you can contribute on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash emergencymind. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash emergencymind. Okay, all that said, let's jump into this awesome episode. I hope you enjoy. All right, Mike, it is so good to sit down with you, man, in a very different context than some of the other times that we've worked together on stuff. I'm honored to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. There's nobody in the waiting room. (laughs) Genuine shocker. Must be a dream that we're having right now as opposed to the actual reality. I think we had our waiting room hit 90 people the other day. Unbelievable. On on top of whatever we have, 100 and... 20 bed ER or something like that. So 150 bed ER. So that is a considerable amount of folks needing care. In any case, for folks that don't know you, that aren't familiar with what you're up to, either past, present, or future, do you mind giving folks just a real quick introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. I'll spare people all the personal childhood stuff and go straight to the (laughs) professional history. So I trained as an emergency physician out in California about 20 years ago. Worked in academic, critical access, and community hospitals for about 15 to 18 years, and then transitioned into precision medicine about two years ago. So got involved with a startup called Wild Health that provides genomics-based personalized care. So really looking at moving the care continuum leftwards and getting to the root of things like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular risk, and meeting people where they are working on lifestyle interventions predominantly to reverse some of these chronic diseases and keep people healthy as opposed to seeing them in the emergency department with the complications of those illnesses. So it's been a really dramatic shift moving Mm -hmm. to spending lots of time with a patient as opposed to 60 to 90 seconds in a room with a patient and getting to dive deep into helping people heal on a less acute, more long-term basis. Just to wrap some context around this for folks listening, we talk a lot on the podcast and with the Emergency Mind Project about our prepare, perform, recover, and evolve cycle. 
And we really believe that even when you think about the moments of optimal performance of elite level performance and individuals, teams, and organizations, that so much of what we're able to do in those moments comes from the way that we prepare and the way that we recover. And obviously the other stuff that is in that cycle, but I can't say all of it because that doesn't make any sense. So the way that we prepare and recover. And I think that's what we're going to focus on mostly as we talk about this today, because the stuff that Mike is working on is so cool when it comes to really setting yourself up for success and also being able to come down from whatever it is that you're doing. But I actually want to start in a totally different direction, which is that I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, but your time in some of the critical access hospitals, which is a really different environment than a lot of the academic centers and a lot of the other stuff that we worked in. If you don't know, critical access hospitals are small hospitals that are in places where there's otherwise basically no access to healthcare. They might be the only emergency physician for an extended radius you might catch your catchment area might be enormously huge. Depending on the hospital, you might be the only ER doctor on for a shift. You might even be the only doctor in the hospital for the entire shift. And the way that you practice, the way that you think, the way that you perform is really different in those spaces versus if you're in a ultra modern level one trauma center where you have a team of dozens of doctors with you. So can we go back in time just slightly? Yeah. What was that like? What's it like working in critical access hospitals for you? How did you start in those spaces and how did you think about performance when you were there? Yeah, so I got started working in a small critical access hospital in on the California coast, just south of the Oregon border. This would have been maybe 2010 or so. So I'd been out for a little bit and I had a friend who ran the Gorilla Locums Group that would staff some of these hospitals in California that were short on physicians. So every month for about a year and a half, I would take the BART to San Francisco International, take a prop jet up to the location and then rent a car at this airport and go work three or four 13 hour overnight shifts. So 7P to 8A, come back to the apartment that they had rented for the docs who would come in and just crash during the day and then go out and sit by the coast until it was time to go back into my shift. It was night and day from any experience I'd had in emergency medicine. There was a hospitalist and the emergency doc, single coverage and 14 bed emergency department. You might have a night shift where you'd see 10 patients and you might have a night shift where you'd see 35 patients. So it was really hit or miss and no orthopedist in the county, no neurologist in the county, no cardiologist in the county. One general surgeon who was on call for 12 weeks every day who tried to do daytime surgeries as well. And then you'd call them in for stuff you really needed them for, not for stuff that you were wondering about. Pediatrics, probably about 40% of the patient volume. And you just really quickly learned that you needed to recognize people who needed a higher level of care, the ball rolling to fly them out fixed wing to one of the referral centers. And you did things that you would just never do in a, in a hospital staffed with consultants. You might see a complicated open hand fracture dislocation, and you're going to do a nerve block or a procedural sedation on that person, wash out their hand, sew it up, splint it, and send them to an outpatient orthopedic follow-up, which is just not at all what would happen. That person would go to the operating room at right. a, a more well-equipped hospital. I think just really humbling. I definitely extended the scope of skills that I felt I was able to provide. And in terms of preparation, I think I was reading more and listening more to podcasts and trying to hone my skills more at that time prior to those shifts than I ever did going in to teach residents or work in a well-staffed hospital where you have that sort of backup on hand. So having also spent time working in solo coverage, critical access hospitals in Northern California, just south of the Oregon border, you know, what you're describing is a lot of the mental difference that it is, right? Like you, you operate under a different set of resources. And so the way that you approach problem sets is very different, even if the problem set itself is very similar to what you might face in another institution. And so there's a bunch of questions that go into sort of how do you prepare? How do you train for something like that? How do you get yourself ready to do that? But in keeping with the spirit of what we're here doing today, let me ask a slightly different, like 20 degrees off from that question. What does it feel like to be there? How do you get yourself ready physically to do a 12 hour shift where you're it, where the pressure's on you for the entire 12 hours? How do you sleep afterwards? How do you eat? How do you do these things that allow you to be the person that tackles those problem sets? And I think that's a subtly different but equally important question to how do you mentally prepare to face problem sets with limited resources? And it's one that we don't spend enough time 
working on. Like one of the first several times that I was in that space, really struggled to handle not just the mental aspects of those problem sets, but the physical aspects of being in that space and being the person and trying to sort through what do I do with that kind of stuff. So what did that look like for you then? I guess I'll take the physical prep side of it first. So the way that I physically prepared for that is that I was in my young 30s and I could (laughs) handle anything. (laughs) So went about it completely wrong from what I know now and what I advise people to do in terms of physically preparing for shift work and post-shift recovery and sleep. I would fly up there, often get diverted because of fog, have to either rent a car an hour and a half away or I hitchhiked once from Oregon to get to my shift in time and would go straight into my shift having eaten probably something at Subway and then drink coffee all the way through my shift and go back to the apartment and try and sleep as much of the day as I possibly could, wake up and repeat and just rinse and repeat and do it again. We know a lot about optimizing sleep for shift workers. And there's a million things that I would have changed about my approach to that and even the group's approach to it. In terms of preparing for a shift, ideally what you're going to do is make sure that you're going into your shift with as much alertness and fresh preparation as possible. My approach tends to differ if you're working multiple shifts versus you're working a single isolated night shift. But let's say we're working multiple shifts. I'll try and stay up late the night before my night shift so that I can sleep in a little bit during the day. That's one approach. That's what worked well for me. If you're able to do a two-hour nap in the evening before you go into that shift, that's another equally valid and really impactful move. If you're looking to nap, it's really a two-hour nap. You want to try and get, we go through these sleep architecture cycles over the course of the night and most people it's about an hour and a half to two hours to transition from light sleep into deep sleep and then back into rem sleep and to get one full cycle in so hour and a half to two hour nap if you're a caffeine person drink coffee before your shift when you go in and don't sip on coffee all night long depending on your genomics there are some folks who are looking at 50% of the caffeine that they take at 9 p.m. is going to still be circulating in their blood at 9 a.m. So you may be a slow caffeine metabolizer. You may have some anxiety associated with caffeine. If you've got a specific Adora 2A SNP or particular genetics, you may be somebody who just needs to move to decaf coffee or tea, or you may be somebody who can really drink coffee pretty well. But regardless of how fast you metabolize, if you're sipping all night long, you're going to have a really disrupted sleep architecture when you go to bed the next morning. So that's something that I definitely changed as I got further on into my years and into my career doing nights in emergency medicine. The avoidance of circadian stimulators post-shift. So when we see sunlight, our bodies tell us it's morning. And we really need a lot of light in the mornings. So not night shifts. Let's just pretend it's like a regular normal diurnal cycle. You need a a lot of light in the morning to signal that it's time to wake up. So when I'm getting people entrained onto a healthy circadian rhythm, one of the main things I do is get people outside in the first hour after awakening without sunglasses to get 20 to 40 minutes of sunlight. And you don't need to stare at the sun or do anything stupid, but you just need to be out there without sunglasses on getting some light. That's our body's trigger that we're going to get our melatonin pulse at the right time of night to make us sleepy. We need a lot of light there and you could do it with like a light box if you needed to entrain for a night shift. Let's say you're doing like two weeks at night, so you could use Mm. some photomodulation to help you there. But we really need next to no light to ruin our nighttime cycle. So when you get off of an 8 a.m. shift, it's light outside already and you really need to have some hardcore wraparound sunglasses on if you're going to be able to get from the emergency department back to your apartment or your home to get some sleep and not trick your brain into thinking that it's actually morning time and you need to be waking up. So not only my own practice of I didn't do that at the time, I certainly started doing that later in my career, but also just the group's practice. Like You should not be having people get off of a night shift at 8 a.m. You want to end your night shifts at maybe 6 or if you have the the staffing for it, you want to do casino nights and have people, you know, go 10P to 4A. You get off, it's dark, you go home, you sleep, it's no problem. And then you've got those folks getting up at 4A or 3A to come in and start their day shift. It's early, but they can get out and see the sun within a couple of hours of awakening and you've got them on a regular daytime cycle. Being really mindful and really deliberate about your light exposure on your retina 
is something that's invaluable for not ruining your circadian rhythm and really trashing the quality of your sleep. Okay. So what I hope we're going to wedge this into is one of the structures that we use a lot is called this ITSO matrix, right? The rows are individual team and structural or organizational, and the columns are on the X or off the X, right? And this three by two matrix gives us a a structure with which to figure out where our interventions are going and where our teams need more work. So everything we're talking about right now is off the X, right? It's like preparing for and recovering for what's happening. And we can talk about what to do on shift a little bit later, but this individual team and systems level stuff really wedges into what you're talking about. So there's stuff, there's choices that you make, and there's choices that your team makes around you and choices that the system makes around that to improve or trip you up for this kind of thing. I guess let's start with that. What would optimal look like for you? Let's say I've got a huge group. I've got plenty of space to work on things. I can control all of the schedules. I can do everything. What do you imagine the optimal universe is for people that have to work sometimes at night and to help them prepare and get into elite performance? Ideally, people know their chronotype. So are you an early morning ariser? Are you a night owl? And there's online quizzes you can take that are actually pretty decent for that to figure out what your ideal sleep and wake time is. Once you actually know what your chronotype is, and people tend to know this sort of instinctively, an ideal situation for nights is you have nocturnists who like working night shifts. They're not switching back and forth. They're dedicated night docs and people who don't want to be awake at night are not awake at night. That'd be ideal. If you can't do that, progressive scheduling. So no surprise there for shift workers, right? You want to start your shifts. Maybe let's say you have a 10 a.m. shift for two days. Your next shift should be a 3 p.m. shift as opposed to being a 7 a.m. shift. So you want to move forward progressively with the time that you're starting your shifts. It just lets you advance your sleep time by a few hours each day or two. And then when it comes time to work a night, you're actually just making a gradual jump instead of this massive jump from days to nights. Knowing people's sleep phase types, or are they early versus delayed sleep phase? Can they fall asleep easily in the morning versus it takes them a while after a night shift to go to bed? That can inform, are they going to aim for up for a while afterwards, keeping light stimulation low and then sleeping later in the day before their shift versus coming home and trying to conk out right away. And then casinos. Groups that have moved to casino nights tend to stay on casino nights and have low attrition because people really enjoy them. It's it's a jump. You're telling people, well, you're basically working two night shifts. They're shorter, but you've got one shift that ends at four in the morning and one that starts at four in the morning. So sometimes group buy-in can be a challenge for that. They're called casino nights because that's what casinos do in terms of staffing the pits and taking care of a 24-hour operation. And it tends to work out really well in terms of sleep hygiene. And can we break that down and define that? Because I'm not sure we've ever used that term here before. What actually defines a casino night? Is it just the dual shifts at 4 a.m.? It tends to be shorter shifts that end in the middle of the night like that. So you've got somebody going 10p to 4a, getting to bed while it's dark. And you've got somebody getting up a little bit earlier than sunrise and working a day shift. So say 4A to 10, and you look at a typical emergency medicine schedule and it's 7A, 3P, 11P, something similar. You're just on days, mids, and nights. And it's just a, it's just a much harder adjustment for folks to be able to do that. Now, when you're on shift for, for sleep optimization, there's a few things you can do there as well. One would be proper use of caffeine, like we talked about. There's some folks who really advocate for modafinil. I guess to stimulate non-amphetamine stimulant to keep you up at night. With the right dose of minafidel, you can definitely decrease nighttime sleepiness and cognitive impact on performance. Low incidence, but it does happen that people can get some weird like sleep dyscrasias, waking up subjective paralysis and other sort of really unnerving things that you wouldn't want happening to you around right. your sleep. Definitely under the, the guidance of a physician and make sure that it's something that you're monitoring closely. Talked a little bit about a light box. So mm-hmm. you'll look like the nerd in the group for sure when you bring your photo light box to the emergency department and turn it on for the first couple of hours of your night shift. But it is going to trick your circadian rhythm into thinking now it's morning. That's a solid way to go if you're willing to take the teasing from the nursing staff and your <laughs> colleagues. Put down the pop tarts on the night shift. Our circadian rhythm, most of us just think of it as nighttime, daytime, waking, sleeping, but our Glucose and insulin metabolism is highly impacted by the circadian rhythm. Pancreas has melatonin receptors. So if you're chugging down Pop-Tarts and donuts and Oreos on your night shift, you are really just giving your body everything it needs to become insulin resistant, diabetic in the long run. There's no question 
that sleep debt and just lack of sleep chronically in shift workers. And we never really said this. Yes, it's physicians, but it's nurses, it's first responders. Oh, absolutely. Casino workers. There's so many people who work these crazy 24-hour staffing schedules. We know that the impacts on health are just enormous. Everything from diabetes to cardiovascular disease to all-cause mortality to cognitive decline, dementia, the list goes on and on. I wonder how much of a contribution just what people eat on night shift has to those studies, because if you've ever been in a night shift in an emergency department, it's not like a whole foods, healthy salad with some grass fed protein on it. (laughs) It's processed foods, highly caloric, low nutritional value. And I think we're really tuned up to have that really impact our bodies negatively just so much more so than if you're eating that same junky food during the day. That's the sort of the last thing. And I'll, I'll pause and stop talking there. We can go where we want, but don't eat before bed when you come home after your night shift. Pre-night shift, a little bit of optimization during the shift itself. And then from a health perspective, you're definitely you're blocking out light, but don't come home and eat. Number one, you're going to make, if anybody's done this, which I mea culpa, I for sure have, you do not make healthy choices when you come home after a night shift. You're going to go straight to the leftover pizza or the cookies or whatever's sitting around. And again, you're just, you're at a phase in your cyclical insulin metabolism where you're relatively insulin resistant at that point feeding yourself after a night shift is just a, it's a recipe for metabolic syndrome and prediabetes. All right. We're going to pause briefly where I consider all of the mistakes that I have made over the past. If I can recommend a real, a real slap in the face for any interested listeners, if you have not read Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, phenomenal book. I think the unifying take home from that for anybody who has worked night shifts is, oh my Lord, what have I done? So why do we do this? Not to wax philosophical away from insulin and melatonin for a second. We were talking before we turned on the record thing here about some of the deeper sort of life and death affirming pieces of what it is that we do. And like, how do you balance that, right? How do you balance the need to have somebody on the line? Society needs us, right? Society needs us to be on the line. We all agree that's an important thing to hold back the night as it were. And how do you balance that with the personal cost of doing this kind of work? I think somebody shows up and tries to rob your 24-hour convenience store at three in the morning. You really hope that there's a police officer who's working the night shift. It's societally, there are just certain services that we expect to be available all the time. Obviously, an emergency department's one of those. I think we could do a lot better job of letting people who go into these careers know about the risks and the impact on your life that shift work and overnight work is going to have. I think You hear about it in medicine, but I definitely, and granted, I was in medical school in the dark ages, but we did not have any knowledge or or real instruction around the impacts of long-term overnight shift work on health and longevity. And I think that it's just something that doesn't get talked about much. I, I wish I had a good solution for how to make this sustainable and not have a negative long-term health impact. But if you're going to look at us from an ancestral or evolutionary perspective, human beings sleep at night. Guess what? So do all diurnal mammals. That's how we're built. We need this. What happens when we sleep? When I was in medical school, the concept of the glymphatic system hadn't even been discovered. Basically, when we sleep, our brain cells are washed with fluid and toxins are cleansed from the cerebrospinal fluid and the space around those little like peri and paralymphatic channels in our brain. So we need to sleep. If you take somebody and you sleep deprive them in a lab, you can do, this sounds like a horrible study, by the way, to be a participant in, but they've done studies where they take folks, they intentionally sleep deprive them overnight and then do a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap on them the next day. No, I'm not signing up for that study under any circumstances, but just with one night spikes in beta amyloid protein in their CSF. And for those of you not familiar, protein linked to Alzheimer's disease, certainly lots of controversy about whether it's causative or not, probably not causative. But we see that you're building up these toxins in your supraspinal fluid with just one night of sleep deprivation. So we don't know what that means long-term. Does that mean you've got a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease at a younger age because you had one night of sleep deprivation? Probably not. But years and years of doing that to ourselves 
there's really long-term effects that we know are linked to sleep deprivation and sleep cycle disruption. And I don't have a great solution. How do you do it with, unless we get the robots from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., I think there's going to be human beings who are sacrificing some of their longevity and long-term risk for chronic health issues by working that overnight shift. And if anything, that just makes me have a ton more respect for the people who do it because it's a vital societal service, but it's there, there's definitely, it comes at a cost. I think, you know, certainly in emergency medicine and in a, a lot of the folks that listen to this serve in some version of a space where they are routinely running the calculus of putting themselves at risk for service to something greater than themselves, right? Whether that is an ER doctor or somebody in the military or any of the other folks that have listened to this and reached out to me and explained some of their stories about what they do, right? Most of us that are part of the Emergency Mind Project work in a space where we are putting ourselves at risk to serve something greater. And I think that's a discussion that's worth having out loud and consciously, right? Because there's ways to do that where it's worthwhile, bordering on noble sometimes, something where you're doing this because it's better for humanity. And there are ways to do it where it's not, where it's self-destructive, where it's disempowering and where it's you, and by you, I mean me, running away from certain things in my life that I wasn't ready to really dig into. And there have certainly been times when I've been on either end of that line. There's a concept in here that's worth getting at, which is something that I guess, I'm not sure there's an exact name for it, but to me, it borders on a concept that we borrow from radiology, which is the Alara principle, right? Which basically means as low as reasonably achievable. You're really Perfect. bringing back my ultrasound days right now. There we go. As low as reasonably achievable. Can we design systems? We're not talking about eliminating risk to humans. We're not talking about driving risk to zero. We're not talking about creating a system where humans don't make conscious choices to put themselves at risk for the betterment of humanity. Because that's the civilization that I want to continue to be a part of. I am proud to be one of those people, as I know you are from all of our conversations, who does the work that keeps humanity moving forward. But can we design systems that make that risk to us as low as reasonably achievable? We are so far from that when it comes to this kind of work. And I think that's why I'm so excited to, to dig more into this with you, because I think that we can design better things that allow us to make a personal choice to put myself at risk for a better ideal, but in a way that doesn't sacrifice me needlessly, doesn't mm -hmm. chew me up through a grinder and spit me out the other end for no freaking reason, which is sometimes what it feels like working night shifts and being an ER doctor. And I'm sure everybody listening to this feels some version of that. You think about the training that you get either in medical school, residency and beyond on uh, nonviolent de-escalation of an agitated patient or on how to get into a into a situation to make sure that the staff is safe. Even as simple as somebody showing up with an organophosphate poisoning, right? We like like that's really going to happen to like more than 0.01% of emergency providers in the history of the United States, right? Really rare scenarios that were prepared for were step 1, get on personal protective equipment and make sure the staff is protected before you start yeah. decontaminating so other people don't get sick, right? We know we're in harm's way. We're, our priority is to make sure that our staff is safe, we're safe, the patient's safe. It's so deliberate, it's so programmatic, and it's really dialed, right? And then you contrast that with, hey, you're working nights tonight. There's nothing about, this is what we're gonna do to help you get prepared. This is how you prepare individually. This is how you perform on shift. This is how you, you recover from shift. This is what our department thinks is an appropriate use of GABA, L-theanine, Ambien, melatonin, like here's our approach to really, we're going to have a, we have a wellness committee or physician health committee that wants to make sure that you're recovering well from sleep. When it was COVID and we were in the peak surge, there were open beds in the hospital where staff could sleep and recover there because they were working longer hours. And there was all of a sudden a deliberate movement towards let's try and keep our staff healthy. And yet, while we do that in all sorts of scenarios, both in and outside of medicine, we really have ignored this. You learn tips and tricks just along the way from, hey, you're exhausted after your night shift and the fresh doc comes in and goes, how was your night? And you just don't even have to say anything because you look like sure. how the night was. And they go, hey, what are your tips? And maybe people share some knowledge that way, but there's no from a plan, do, study, act kind of cycle or any other right. sort of virtuous cycle, like we, we don't really iterate on sleep optimization 
as a medical profession, maybe if you're a sleep physician and that's your mm-hmm. one area of specialty, right? But those folks, no, no offense, meant are working day shifts. <laughs> They're not up <laughs> in the middle of the night. So maybe do as I say, not as I do. Sure. I'm not sure, but I think you're right. It's a whole. We talked again a, a little bit before we we turned this thing on about we also don't help providers cope with post traumatic stress or, or really challenging things that they face on shift. And I think that sleep optimization is in the exact same bucket. It's just don't talk about it. It's just part of the job and it's hard. So good luck coping with it. A mutual friend and colleague of both of ours, Eric Antonson, came on the podcast a while back and talked about a lot of his work with NASA. And one of the things he talked about is a very subtle but crucially important change that they had worked on was creating the name. And Eric, I'm sorry, I'm butchering this slightly, but creating the name around this idea of the human system. Right, because he had a hard time, and his group had a hard time when they were going back and forth about design principles for space missions, explaining to people that humans needed support, maintenance, and work just like other parts of the spacecraft did. Right, because there was this concept that there's the propulsion system and there's the navigation system, and they make trade offs. And every time they make a trade off, the weight, the extra weight, would fall on the astronaut to do something Hmm. different. Right. And finally, they had this idea about what if we just called it the human system? Oh, we can't just put all the weight on one system and assume that it's endlessly elastic and that it's going to get better and just soak up whatever extra risk we take. Instead, it's a system like any other system. It's the human system. And that has really stuck with me as I've moved beyond that episode and thought through my own self and my own team, which is how are we approaching people as these endlessly elastic risk tolerating sponges? which is like not a particularly meaningful way to describe somebody, or are we thinking of them as the human system? And that really dovetails into this because you're describing really thinking about them as a system that is worthy of maintenance and support and structure and plan, do, build, act cycles and investigation about how to make this better. Wow, are we far away from that? As a healthcare system, we're tremendously far away from that, right? What we do is we wait for somebody to Maybe we do a decent job of offering routine health cares and screenings and vaccinations and that sort of stuff. But like how look, go into any hospital and go to the cafeteria or the Chick-fil-A or the McDonald's in the lobby, right? We're feeding people food that we know leads to chronic health conditions and we'll just deal with it later, right? They're going to come in and have some coronary artery disease. So we'll handle that problem and they're going to get some diabetes. Okay. We'll handle that problem. And from a, one of the things that I love about working at Wild Health with the people I work with is our first interaction with the patient is a goals oriented interaction with a health coach. So, what's going on in your life that's working well? What's not working well? What do you see in five years for yourself? What do you want to change from a health perspective? And then we're able to dive deep into people's not just labs and genomics, but their actual their medical history, their intentions, and go, let's run some, we don't call them plan, do, build, or study, act. We just say, all right, let's get to work. And what gets measured gets managed. And we start looking at sleep tracking. We start looking at what their fitness regimen looks like, how they're recovering with heart rate variability. We treat them like a propulsion system, except a much more holistic approach to human performance and recovery patients who are in their 60s with diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And we've got people who are winning the CrossFit games and playing for national teams at the US level and professional leagues that trying to shave off a second from their time or trying to just accelerate a little bit faster so that they can catch more passes in their football game. And It doesn't really matter where the patient is in their journey. It could be somebody who's pretty healthy and just wants to be able to pick up their kids and play with them when they're a grandparent, or it can be somebody performing at like the elite athletic level. Everybody benefits from a holistic look at how is your human system performing right now? And where are the areas where we need to spend some time and attention? What's running really well that could probably be deferred for a few months? And I love that analogy from Eric. I was going to ask you if he podcasted with you from space or not. It's like a compassionate engineer's approach right? to, yeah, we'll treat your body like a system, but the things that actually matter to you may not be your pulse rate, your blood pressure, 
they may include those things, but they're also probably things like, what are your social relationships like? How much stress are you feeling? What do you worry about? What brings you joy? Those are things that, that lend the human element to mm. really helping people achieve their best. Yeah, man. Healthy people in healthy groups, in healthy communities supported by healthy systems, right? That's the goal from medical school onward is build this. So much of the time though, we end up talking about, oh, you're already off the curve over here. How do we rescue? How do we salvage kind of things? And I hope that as, I think that's one of my goals from the Emergency Mind Project as well, is spending more time building right as opposed to fixing wrong. And that's a, that is a work in progress for me personally, for the teams that I am on, for everything. It's certainly a work in progress for all facets of emergency medicine that I've seen so far. Yeah, I think it was a long way to go. These kinds of systems approaches and just actually starting to treat it deliberately, mm -hmm. trying to treat it intentionally, like it's something that's worth fixing. That's a major shift, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a like, major, like major we shift. are worth, like we are something that is worth fixing, right? That we're not endlessly elastic risk absorbing sponges to continue to use that metaphor, right? That instead we're worthwhile people who make a noble choice to put ourselves at risk to do a better purpose. And that's just so far from a lot of what we're seeing. But okay, think of, the, think of the language we use though. And yeah. uh, I'll let you keep yeah. going. But the, uh, like when somebody's a resident and they see a lot of patients and make a lot of quick decisions, wow, she's such a strong resident. It's like strong. Yeah, she's amazing. That's true. She's performing really well. But is she strong on the inside? Is she like bottling up all of the trauma from the patient, the horrible bad news she had to give to the young father who just got diagnosed with metastatic cancer? Or is she going home and crying over it because it, the grief is so heavy? We don't look at that. The language of medicine is about show up, toughen up, work your night shift, do the right thing, don't make any mistakes, be strong. And that's really hard to be sustainable for an individual. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why stress, mental health issues, suicide, attrition, burnout, like these are uh, all predictable consequences of running a high stress environment with no room for error, with no deliberate discussion of how to keep yourself healthy, both physically, emotionally, spiritually. So the kind of work that you're doing here, the, these kinds of discussions, I think, are so important to work towards a professional societal level healing and not just individuals. Like I think it's growing, right? You're seeing these conversations more. These yeah. are, people are talking about burnout. It, the, this stuff was for my like third reference of how old I am. This wouldn't like nobody talked about this. This yeah. was just not a thing when I went through medical school. And honestly, when I went through residency and I loved my sure. residency, some great years, but nothing about, hey, this takes a toll on you and we want to keep you healthy and make sure you're doing okay. We had nothing like this at Harvard where you and I intersected the first time either, right? Like, this just wasn't part of what we were training. And I'm proud to say that we're bringing some of that training into our residence now, although it's still in a really nascent stage as we're learning how to do it the right way. Let's bridge off that, right? So we have this tradition of calling people who show up burn as hard as possible for their entire shift, and then go back to whatever void they came from as a strong resident. That's probably short-sighted, overly narrow, and in the long scheme of things, an inefficient and terrible way to run a system. What would you replace that with? How do you structure that kind of conversation to and with residents that helps you and them see the larger picture? Let me turn that around a little bit. I'm just as guilty because I was your attending at one point, but has a, a supervising physician or a senior resident or an attending ever stopped you in the hospital setting and said, hey man, how are things going? Are you happy? I think there were one or two times when that happened, but those happened at times when there were already known to be difficult things going on in my life or in the lives of my counterparts. There was a chunk of time where I was sleeping on a bare floor and a sleeping bag on somebody else's apartment because of various things in my life in between night shifts. Talk about not a particularly great setup. And eventually that became known to the greater residency and folks were like, Dan, can we help you here? And so like, there, there's a level beyond which it kicks in. That was a pretty far example off of the curve. And there's your traditional healthcare system approach, right? right. It's already broken. So now we're going to try and fix it. But where's the, how are you doing? Clearly, you're doing a great job seeing patients. You seem like you're performing really well, learning the skills of emergency medicine, 
according to the rubric of how you're supposed to progress. But what's going on personally for you? Are you having a lot of stress? How are you sleeping? Are you getting out and moving your body? What's going on with you? And where are you at right now? Are there things that are happening to people that you love that are stressing you out? It's that proactive, open-ended questions, investigative, curious approach of how is this person who I work with actually doing? And not let me wait until they show up unshaven and with bags under their eyes. And then I'm going to ask them how they're doing. And I think that's a fundamental shift that actually doesn't take that much effort. Regular check-ins. And if you're doing really well, which let's face it, are, you know, how many of us are always doing really well? Not that much. But if you're doing really well and it's a good time for you and you feel like you're living intentionally the way you want, that's a short meeting. That's a really short meeting, right? You share a story about something fun you did recently and then you move on. And I don't think it takes that much time. I think having peer advocates, physician advocates, people whose job it is just to check in, it's a really small investment of time and effort. And I got to say, having been on both sides of those sorts of questions at times when either I needed it or the other person really needed it, it's just invaluable. And you can get things started to help that person heal and recover in a way that's going to be way more effective and a lot less suffering involved if you're doing it before the problem really spirals out of control. For sure. Okay. So we've talked a lot today about imagining like you could wave a wand and rebuild the system in a lot of ways, right? Like you have all of the control points, you can redesign scheduling, you can arm people with all of the tools. Most of us work in systems where we are not the the head of all of this, where I can't influence everything directly. And so a lot of what we're doing is leading from various points on the curve, right? Sometimes we're the most junior person on the team and we're listening to this and we're about to go into six night shifts in a row and be like, have relatively limited control over even like my immediate needs of going to the bathroom or drinking water. Reference back to my time as a medical student on surgery and just wondering when the next time I could drink water would be. Or you're somewhere beyond that, but you're running a small team, or let's say you're the doc overnight at one of these critical access hospitals. You're a locum, so you're not permanent. You're there sometimes. You're trying to bend the culture everywhere around you. How do you do that? The things that you would want folks to start bending in their immediate environment, one of them being to proactively check in with their teammates before things are bad. I think there's a couple of things. If you're junior enough on the medical or other professional hierarchical totem pole that systems level changes are going to be really difficult. You just, you don't feel like you've got a voice that you can really bring to it in terms of the big things, scheduling and timing of shifts, et cetera. I think optimizing your own performance, both pre on and post shift is that's low hanging fruit. You can dive into right away. And we haven't even talked about a cold, dark room white noise, letting your family or other people know on days that you're going to be sleeping during the day, no electronics in the room. So you're not getting that breakthrough. I thought I put sleep mode on my phone, but here's like AT&T calling me about a promotion and disturbing your sleep. There's so many things that you can do to just optimize how you perform. That's one. And that doesn't involve anyone else. So that's all on the individual level. Maybe family and friends involves a little bit, but they'll support you. When you look into team-based training. And I know you're really deep into team-based training and optimizing team performance. Meeting just at the beginning of a shift. I think I did that when I worked nights in that critical access spot. I would just spend five minutes, go around, say hi to the folks who were on. If I didn't know them, I'd introduce myself because maybe it was a locums nurse coming who I hadn't worked with before and just open up channels of communication. Say, hey, if things are spiraling or you've got a patient that you're not really sure what to do with, I'm really happy for you to come and talk to me instead of guessing. You know what you're doing. I don't want to get in your hair, but I don't want you to feel like you can't come and talk to me or you don't want to bother me. And that goes a really long way because we don't even think that as physicians, I think we often don't think other people may not want to bother us with things because we are, we're running around and we're busy. But was there ever a problem that came up in the emergency department that I wished I had learned about later? Not once. Just having that open communication. And sometimes folks really just need you to tell them outright, I'm here. I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to be annoyed that you're bothering me. If I'm busy doing something, I may hold up my hand and give you a five. I'm going to come talk to you in five seconds, but I want you to be able to talk to me. And as you build those relationships, I was going there maybe two or three months. And at that point, I knew the staff that was there. And I check in with them. How was the last few nights with Dr. X, Y, or Z who was working? Are things running smoothly? Anything going on that I can help with? And once or twice, I had somebody tell me about something that was going on at home. 
that was really on their minds. And I think that they felt a lot better just being able to know that I knew that if they were a little bit off or a little bit distracted, that it wasn't that they didn't care about their job. They actually had something more important, frankly, going on with their own lives. So I think so much of it just boils down to being open and curious and letting people know you're not going to judge them for coming to you and either raising a concern or asking a question. Love it, man. Mike, as we head towards the wrap up here, is there anything that you want folks listening to to do next? We talked about a ton of ideas, right? Stuff you can do to optimize your own sleep and your own recovery. We talked about light exposure, talked about putting down the pop tarts. We talked about opening yourself up to communication with your team and really starting to investigate this. If you're leading systems, we talked a lot about different changes you could make and anything we didn't hit, anything else that you want folks to do? I think we did a pretty good job on sleep. There's lots of minutia we could go into. People don't remember more than four or five sure. things <laughs> uh, at a time, as we both know. And we're no different. I don't want to I bombard people with more info on the details of sleep. I think the one other thing, our approach at Wild Health is really built on the pillars of health, sleep, nutrition, movement, social interaction, stress reduction. We would encourage every emergency provider or other acute provider of any kind, first responder to, or folks in the military, no matter how woo-woo you think it may be, start building a a mindfulness practice. And that can look different for everybody. That could be walking meditation. If you're somebody who doesn't like to sit, it could be mindfulness meditation with one of the half dozen or dozen excellent apps out there to get you started with guided meditation. If you're not already doing it, could be a holotropic breath work or just box breathing or, or resonance breathing. I think the fact that we don't institute that for people working in acute care environments as a mandatory, the same way we institute tuberculosis screening is shocking to me. And that'd be the one other thing just from a making these implicitly difficult, challenging jobs a little bit easier is building up a way to, to handle some of that allostatic emotional load and just be a little bit more emotionally and spiritually resilient. I love it, man. For folks that want to learn more about Wild Health, where can they find you? So you can go to wildhealth.com if you're interested in becoming a patient, if you're interested in learning more on the provider side as either a health coach or a provider, there's a wildhealth.com forward slash fellowship. There's a couple of different options in terms of a really high touch mentoring experience versus a more asynchronous online experience. They're both CME accredited and it's an amazing group of like-minded folks who are trying to change medicine one little bit at a time. Just straight up wild health, W-I-L-D-H-E-A-L-T-H.com. Perfect. Mike, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. It is an honor to get to talk to you about all of this and just thank you, man. It was a pleasure. I feel like we're going to turn off the recording on this thing and we're still going to talk for another two hours because there's a lot to cover, but happy to to join you. And yeah, I really appreciate the invite. And folks, if you're listening to this, I just want to end by saying you are not an endlessly risk absorbing replaceable sponge. You are in fact a really unique, wonderful human being that deserves to have all sorts of systems wrap around you that allows you to consciously make the choice of when you want to put yourself at risk, when you need to put yourself at risk for the betterment of society. So you're out there being an incredible human system. So keep that shit up. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And if you're curious to learn more about the Wild Health program that Dr. Stone runs, you might consider joining them at an upcoming conference in January 2023 in Sedona, Arizona called the Wild Health Awake and Aware Series. It's a three-day CME-accredited event focused on healthcare providers and first responders, and it includes world-class education by docs like Rob Orman and Scott Weingart, along with things like breathwork sessions, ice baths, and more. If you're interested, you can head to wildhealthsummit.com and use the discount code CONSCIOUSPHYSICIAN, that's all one word, to save 15% on your registration. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. And you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right. Good luck out there.